Zing and Shingiwe has told you about the criteria and categories and everything about the IUCN red list and how you apply the criteria. Um, I'm just going to show you how we get the data from the field and into decision making and I'm using South Africa as a case study. So in South Africa, we have been fortunate enough for having conducted red list assessments for quite many years, and we have been able to comprehensively assess many of our taxonomic groups. And as you can see here, we've assessed all our vertebrates to invertebrate groups and all our plants. And what's important to emphasize about comprehensive assessments is that I think Shingiwe mentioned it, that you're not cherry picking the species that you want to do an assessment on and say you go five reptiles in Angola, they come, you assess them and they are threatened. And you can't really say anything about reptiles in Angola, you can only say something about those particular species that you have assessed. So doing these comprehensive assessments, which means you assess all known reptiles in a specific region, in this case in South Africa. And what we can immediately see from these graphs is most species are coming out as least concern. Um, and, and the brown here indicates data deficiency. So Bazing explained that if you don't have enough information to actually conduct a red list assessment, this highlights species that needs research. So from just conducting the assessments, you already have, you're able to pull lots of information from different taxonomic groups. Also just looking at the summary here, you can see freshwater fishes as, as more than, almost 50% of the taxa are threatened. And this is a species in freshwater systems. It's um, highlighting species in freshwater are highly impacted. And this is a global trend. You're seeing it across the world. Um, so that's one output from doing a red list that you can actually grasp about the different taxonomic groups. Um, and you can also highlight the research needs. So you can see for mammals, there's also quite a few data deficient species. And um, however, most of our species are actually categorized as least concern. Then I'm just taking you into the workflow. Bazinga has gone through this, but I'm just gonna focus on the actual data collection. So in the past, or data collection includes historical occurrence data, as well as current occurrence records. Um, as well, I'm just sorry, I just get the laser. So historical records. And in the past, you had to travel far to get to those herbaria and to get to those museums to actually see and engage um, with those specimens and to check is it the correct species, etc. Currently, most of many museums and herbaria has been digitized, meaning that you can access those records from anywhere you are in the world. Once these data has been digitized, we also do a process of georeferencing to see. To, to add some um, precision on how accurate that record is. So in the past, um, people use maps and not GPSs, so the precision wasn't great. So we need to know how accurate that record is. And when you do the assessment, you need to know which area to look at um, to infer what kind of pressures might be impacting that species. For current records, many of you are students, you're busy with your research projects. So while you're collecting data on a particular species that you're working on, you can also be contributing um, information that we can use um, if you load your data into GBIV. And some of these platforms are um, South Africa. So these are specific South African examples of citizen science projects where people are out there collecting data, as well as iNaturalist where you upload um, observations and this is a global platform. So once we collect all of this information um, for a particular species, we do a verification process to check does these records belong to that species that you're assessing, as well as has it been properly georeferenced. So in red listing, this is what you spend almost 80% of your time on just collating the records and then verifying it. So in this case, this particular record was not included in the final assessment, and that could be the record did not belong to the target species, or um, after georeferencing it correctly, it actually plotted out where these were. So this would be an endemic species to, to this area in South Africa, and then you apply um, the, the criteria that Bazing just spoke about, and you're able to then come up with an assessment, and then the review process starts that um, Shingiwe was talking about. 
Once, the, once it's published, this data can now be used to inform decision-making. And as Bazing mentioned, the SIS system for global assessments, and then in South Africa, we have a national red list that feeds into this global um, system as well. So once you've completed your assessments, we can look at trends. So how are species doing over time? If you've conducted multiple assessments for groups over time, you can actually look at trends. So how is the status of changing of the species? And we do this with the Red List Index. It's a global index, and we have uh, done this analysis at the national level as well. So any country can conduct this assessment. So things to look out here for is, um, if the index is one, it means all species are least concerned, they're not threatened, they're very happy, they're doing well. If this index goes to zero, it means all species are extinct. So as you can see, if there's a negative trend, it means species are not doing that great. Um, and we can actually delve into which species have changed status and why and identify what the major drivers of that, of that threat is. With the assessments, as Shlingiwe mentioned, you code the different threats to the species, and then we're able to identify what are the major pressures to birds in this example, and even go down to the lowest level of what are those particular impacts. So here, the highest pressure on birds in South Africa is agriculture and aquaculture, and these include wood and pulp plantations, annual and perennial non-timber crops. So you can really see to which level um, the information has been um, collected in the assessment. Also spatially, you can look at different habitats where um, your most threatened groups are. In South Africa, we have these biomes and in each different country, whatever vegetation types you're using, you can then, if you, if you have your spatial data um, available, you can look at what's the threat categories of species within that particular um, habitat. So it's a way of identifying areas that need research and also identifying areas that need um, um, lots of um, conservation efforts, like for plants in the famous, many threatened species and also many data deficient species. Yeah, the gray indicating data deficiency. Um, Shingiwe also mentioned um, protected area expansion. One of my colleagues, Dr. Lisa von Staden, um, uh, produced this map where after we completed our red list assessments and looking at protected areas, we were able to identify sites where you can protect the most threatened species um, in the least amount of areas. So at least protecting one population of a threatened species. So this is now used by conservation agencies to prioritize where they're expanding their protected areas to. And this is um, doable once you've um, I've conducted your red list assessments and your spatial data becomes available. We're also able to map species specific habitat. So this is a species only known from one site. And while you're doing your red list assessment, you're verifying records and you're looking at the particular habitat of the species. This kind of maps become important at the local level where you want to influence um, how the local authorities, uh, where they protect, et cetera. So this could then inform that decision-making. So once you've conducted your red list assessment and all that information is included, you also can produce these maps to influence um, prioritization of sites to protect. In South Africa, we also have a land use screening tool, and this uh, follows a similar process of being able to map where your threatened species are. And we live in a country where there's development pressure, we need to develop, but we also need to do it in a conservation conscious way. And this helps us to, to bring those two priorities together where we can go somebody wants to develop in this particular space and we can say this is the risk to those species this is the number of threatened species in that place um, and then these are the steps that you need to follow if you want to go ahead and develop there um, there's there's a whole um, set of protocols to follow as i mentioned the developing country we need these um, integrated um, strategic infrastructure projects. So from the Department of Energy, they may say they want to put these um, pylons across the country in this particular space. 
then we have the red list data, the spatial information of where our threatened species are, and combining these two, we can guide where these processes take place, and we can say these red areas are really sensitive areas, and we should rather try and avoid them when doing um, these developments, and this we can drill down to the specific taxonomic groups or vegetation types. There's also KBAs, um, Shingiwe and Bazing mentioned it earlier. This is a global process that's currently taking place. And one of the criteria is whether the species is threatened and whether species are range restricted. And with that information, you can contribute to identify um, specific areas to qualify as KBAs. So the red list really feeds into um, identifying research priorities, so species that we need to monitor to, to update their assessments, also species that we need more information about. We influence spatial planning and bioinformatics that you need to present at the local, global, national and global level. And then also in these high level processes where we need to address our sustainable development goals and the red list feeds into these um, policy decisions as well. So thank you everybody for listening and we welcome any questions. So I need to say a big thank you again for the talk and for your work. So with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, I think our main audience has to leave soon. So I'm going to start with them. Uh, Michelle Walters, I'm going to start with you guys. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Just Yes, I know you guys have to leave, in, leave shortly, so I just need to start there if there are any yes. questions there. Thank, thank you so much to the speakers. Just a quick round of applause from us. Yes. So um, I would like to know what proportion of South African taxa are data deficient so that we cannot actually assess them sufficiently. Do we know that? Do we have that data? So I can't give an exact number, but those graphs that I showed, those gray, those gray um, bars indicate the data deficiency, but I could give you an exact number of number of species within each taxonomic group for which, and research, researchers usually use that to guide if they want to do some further research, so that is available on the SAMB website, and you can email me for it. Thank you, I'll be doing that, thanks a lot. And just just to just to highlight, Michelle, and to your students, that we really encourage students to. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, we, we can, can hear you. you. Yes, just just to encourage your students that um, the data deficient category is actually so worrying to us, because we don't know if these species are even extinct or like uh, uh, highly uh, threatened. So this is where we need the students to come in and develop projects to get to understand more about the ecology, the distribution, the threats to this species for us to better inform um, the red list assessment. So many conservation or, or postgraduate or undergraduate mini projects could be, um, could be developed around data deficient species to help us um, uh, provide an accurate assessment to them. Because like I said, they could be highly threatened or, or even um, widely distributed, but we don't have that information. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I just, um, on the screen now is a QR code leading to the SAMBI website. Uh, that is not just for this current talk or, or is focused on this current talk, but all their projects. But for the current talk, um, Simi, I want to know the online red list training course. Is more information available there? Um, I think, uh, is it Lengi? Someone has put it in the chat. So okay. that could be connected with the, yeah. Okay, um, I see. So it is yeah. available in the chat. Yes. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? So if you do have any questions, you can just raise your hand or ask it in the chat. Uh, the team, bursary opportunities may be available to support research on data deficient species. Okay. Is that on the website? No, it's not necessary from it's not necessary from Sambi, but globally there's lots of opportunities, international funding that goes towards but um research on data deficient species because exactly as Singh said, it 
we, we can't do an assessment if we don't know about more information about it. So the, it's a good motivation for why you'd want to work on a specific species. Yeah, um, uh, I have questions. So if you, this is now post research, if the research has been done, how do I inform you that there's research done on like, for example, stock structure of a fish species, which is the subspecies of a fish species. If I did research on that, do I inform you or do you find the information on your own? Can I go, Bazin? Yeah, so it's two ways. It's two ways. Like I said, in the, in the Redis uh, process, there's a whole, uh, in terms of the process, that data compilation stage where you have to do like in-depth research, um, searching gray literature, searching museums, searching uh, university records to be able to get accurate information on, on species in terms of the distribution of the population. So the project manager or the assessor will be able to get that information. But it's also wise for you to inform, for example, Sanbi, um, the, the division that uh, Dividin and Gengue represent, the threatened species unit. They are really responsible for conducting biodiversity assessment. So if you want to be involved, you can contact them and provide that information as well. And then the second one is you guys spoke about citizen scientists, but I think if you can just mention that again, how they play a role in all of this. So there's the researchers and then the citizen scientists. I think that would be interesting. Maybe Schling, your Schlingiwe. Oh, yeah. So the citizen scientists are playing a huge role because um, we have, um, I don't know if you know of uh, the Custodians of Rare and Endangered Wildflowers program, which is under Sandy. It helps with uh, monitoring and collecting data for species. And we have um, target species that we give to them when we select a species that we want to update. So they help us in gathering the data. They would visit the field and gather more population information or whether it's be of threats, information, the population sizes, and then they feed into the red list. So they play a very huge role because when they collect the data, it also goes to the INET and people, other people who are already interested to even give us more information if they know of a species. So they play a very, very huge role in, in getting us data in updating these assessments. And um, because they are doing the ground truth thing, we also rely on them on getting the information and updating the assessments. So just to complement uh, what um, um, Klingi said, citizen science information is really, really important, especially in applying criterion E, which looks at geographic range. So whether you're calculating the extent of occurrence or the area of occupancy, we could be able to use those species occurrences to calculate those parameters. And we have, South Africa is really blessed with like several citizen science uh, projects from uh, Bird Lassa for those that are ornithologists, um, uh, eye naturalists, um, eye sports. We have several of them where people that are not really scientists or that cannot contribute to the course can provide information in terms of the distribution, the ecology, the threats to the species. And we really collect that information when we are compiling the data to be able to inform the red disassessment process. Yeah. Then uh, there's a question I think from Kerstin. Um, she was asking how how often are assessments updated. So uh, Davidin answered at least ten years, uh, but we also update if uh, new information becomes available uh, that have significant influence on the current status. And also if you have um, like enough resources. Although we we do um, recommend that eight to ten years. There is also the financial limitation to be able to do this um, 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 uh, um, update. And from uh, um, Dividend's uh, presentation, you see that those updates are really, really important for us to be able to produce those trend analysis to see how our species in a particular taxonomic group or how the taxon or just the group of interest is faring over time. Are they, are they recovering or are they declining further? So is that red list index that uh, these updates are really, really important for us. Mm. Thank you, Sami, because um, I was also just thinking uh, your criteria, because even like, I mean, I studied, I was in, I'm in the conservation field, but I didn't even know that there's that many criteria. I always thought it was based only on statistical analysis. So this is very informative for me as well. Um, I just want to know for migration, just like off the top of my head, for example, if you look at that brown veined white winged mm -hmm. moth, 
that. So I see you guys use the geographical range as well. So I'm just thinking, so you citizen scientists, I'm sure they play a very significant part in that because you can't have somebody following that moth alone. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm just thinking how important citizen scientists are in that. Yeah. I think it's very important and migratory species are really of uh, uh, concern for us because there are different things happening along their stopover or their migratory routes. You have different threats, pollution, uh, poisoning, insecticides that affect them. And what, what really happens in the um, uh, assessment process, we don't use the entire migration route, right? So for all those species, we know their core breeding and their wintering grounds where their breeding ground is where they breed, their wintering ground is where they come and feed and like, you know, um, um, uh, um, rejuvenate. And so we use only the breeding ground. That is really, really important for migratory species. We don't use the entire migratory route else we're going to be inflating the assessment um, categories for those species. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I know that's very significant because just for example, for a fish species, example, if you use it, look at the king clip and there's only a specific breeding ground at a specific time of the year. I know this information is so important for the fisheries managers because mm -hmm. if they fish at the breeding ground, we're going to lose that entire species because then it's just, we completely lost the species. Um, the whole, the whole population basically goes to one feeding ground. Yeah, and, yeah so and, this is uh, very think, uh, significant work. We didn't also mention the, the key biodiversity area. So um, yeah, it's another yeah. standard that really fits on the IUC and red list. So yeah. we want to try and protect this feeding ground, this spawning grounds for, for your fish species, for example. We need to protect those sites because if those sites are wiped away, then the, the next generation of the species will also be, be wiped away and we are driving them very fast to, to extinction. So the KBA approach also like tries to identify those important um, areas of biological processes like your um, spawning, your um, um, yeah, spawning and, and the rest. So yeah, the breeding grounds, really, the spawning. It, yeah, it's key for us to, to, to understand this standard and see how they really fits into uh, conservation prioritization. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's very important work. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. um, Asha, to, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Asha, I just want to add for specifically for the marine taxa, we've, we've owned, we, we can't use like their distributions because that data is just not available. But then the data that the fisheries produces on the populations and, and all of like that data is then used in the marine assessments. Um, I've been working on some of the fishes. And yeah, no, no spatial data, but lots of population counts that is, that is done by the department for, for that purposes. So for, I think Bazing mentioned it very, um, very well, we, you can't apply all the criteria. So you work with the data that you have and that's the best we can do until new data becomes available. I see yeah, Kirsten's so, hand is up. Yeah, um, before Kirsten, can I just quickly follow up just a second um, on the fisheries data? So you take all the information from the fisheries, which is all the fisheries. So uh, non-targeted species is that with the stats analysis then come in where you make projections. Yeah, For example, one of what, like, yeah, if hake is hake is a targeted species, so you catch, but non-targeted species like monk or king club, um, do you then make projections with stats analysis? Yeah, so that's where criteria E comes in. We use the modeling. So for okay. most of our species, we don't have that uh, analysis, but then for the fisheries, they can actually do those projections and then we apply criteria E. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Kirsten. Yeah, thank you, Sami, Davidine, and Tengri Yue. Your talk was amazing, very informative and fascinating. Um, I had a question, uh, Davidine. You had a you had some maps of where potentially like say a pilot pylons were being uh, planned for um, and they were they were obviously um, there was it was um, highlighted where there were uh, vulnerable species along those those plans um, how loudly are you heard by planners when you um, when you talk to them about what's going on with biodiversity and uh, do they uh, do they listen to you Okay, so I'll I'll speak for South Africa and the Zinc can maybe give a perspective on other countries. Um, so in so there's these two two things here. In that particular example, it was this um, strategic infrastructure projects for South Africa. So these were high-level projects that needed to, to be um, 
um, taken that needed to to sort of start. And at, for those particular projects, we actually consulted between the two departments at, at the national level, where the uh, plans for where they want those pylons and we, we had the data and that fed into the final plan. So it, at that level, we really had impact because it was at the national level where the, the sort of discussions took place. And then you have normal developments where you want to build like a new building or whatever. And in that case, um, the screening tool that we have in place now that is more is, is used where in the past people who do an EIA, so an impact um, assessment, and they would go out and, and look for species of conservation concern. And in some cases, some specialists were good and others not so great. Um, and then they would say, that species is not present there, so go ahead with the development. But the new system, we can preempt it and we've got the data available already. So you can't say the species is not present. You have to confirm that it's absent. Um, so, so the new screening tool that we have, um, it, it works a bit better in providing the data in advance. And we can only have that um, once we've conducted the read list assessments. Um, I have been, myself and Shlingi, we worked for a citizen science project before we became Red List um, assessors, and we had engagements with farm owners, etc., where they literally said, why can't we lift the species and put it in the next um, site? Because people don't have the same appreciation. So you, you do encounter those. And for me, it was heartbreaking because we in the conservation sector and you're expecting people to feel the same. So I think if you're on the ground working every day, then that engagement is, is very hard. Um, but at the national level, we do try and provide the tools for people to be able to, to engage in a more productive manner and say, rather move your development footprint a bit like, a few kilometers north and the impact will be less. Um, so that's the case for South Africa, but Bazing might be able to have other examples. Yeah, um, no, thank you, uh, Dividin. I, I mean, South Africa is extremely blessed to have the world of experts that can do this um, kind of work for a mega diverse country. We have so many species in South Africa and we have so many experts that are willing to develop these products at the national level. So to have like national ownership for national agency in many African countries, the data is there, but the skills, uh, readiness assessments are not uh, mobilized at the national level. And hence, you see um, there's a lot of development that is happening in many African countries, especially in strategic areas for biodiversity. And these are the things that are driving this biodiversity to extinction. So what countries are doing, um, countries that do not have a national database or national data set like um, South Africa, they are relying on global data sets like the IUC and Red List at the global level. And we have this um, tool, I think uh, Dividin, uh, she, she mentioned the site screening tool. Uh, at the global level, we have what is called the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool. So they harness data from the IUC and Red List, from the World Database on Protected Areas, from Key Biodiversity Area Database. And when development needs to happen, they will just try to look at the footprint of that development using global database, but it's not always representative. So my project, including a colleague from Sambi, um, uh, Domitila, we are working with several African countries to be able to help them to mobilize this uh, national database to be almost like South Africa, where they can inform those development even to like the provincial level. And at the moment, it's, it's very, very hard. and They have to rely on global data sets, like I mentioned. But thank you, guys. I'm going to be in touch with you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, thank you for the work. Yeah, if... yeah, with that, I think we're going to close the floor for today. Thank you again, guys. And please keep up with the work. It's so vital. I think it's the um, it's, it's so core. In, it doesn't matter which area you go into. This mm -hmm. part is, this. it's like one of the first, if not the first step that you look at just to get a, a sense of where the, the uh, animal, plant, organism is. So thank you so much.